And we're back, everybody. Your host, Michael Lofton. We are doing a review of Dr. James White on Cameron Bertuzzi's interest in Catholicism. Multiple people have asked me to review it, so that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to do a first impression review with select timestamps. Now, how is that impossible? Or how is that possible? If this is the first time I'm seeing this, how am I selecting certain timestamps? Well, I had somebody who sent me certain timestamps to review. I did not even read the description of them. I just kind of know around what mark to go to, but I don't really even know what he's talking about in the timestamps um, because I want to keep this as authentic as possible to the concept of a first impression review where you get my. Um, initial reaction and response to what Dr. White says without having seen um, what he is going to say and preparing an answer in advance. Th those tend to be fun. So uh, in keeping with that tradition, I'm going to continue with the first impression review here. But again, with certain select timestamps that others um, have sent to me that I have not uh, reviewed. Um, so I was first told to go to the 44 minute mark. I don't really know what he's talking about at the 44 minute mark, so I'm going to give myself just a little bit of um, uh, preparation by going to the 41 minute mark just so that I have a little bit of context of what's going on jumping into the 44 minute mark not having seen it. So I'm going to give myself a little bit of context by backing it up to right around there. So I have it for, yeah, right around the 41 minute mark. So let's, let's go ahead and begin here. And how does that therefore impact the whole concept of the mass, the propitiatory sacrifice, the idea that you, you know, what the, the, uh, the YouTube video is, what would Catholicism cost Cameron Bertuzzi? Um, this is the issue. It costs you peace with God. Ah, uh, okay. Um, yeah, this is one I've heard pretty often from Dr. White. Um, I think it comes from one of his debates back in the 90s. It, it seems that he felt that this was a really strong critique of Catholicism uh, back in that debate and has continued to perpetuate it. Um, I haven't found it to be very helpful or to be a really cogent critique of Catholicism. His argument effectively is that, well, look, the just man, according to Scripture in the book of Romans, has peace with God, but you don't have peace with God. At best, you have a temporary ceasefire. No, it's not a temporary ceasefire because the other side, God, will never pick up his, his sword or his gun and start firing at us. He's not going to do it. It's not just a temporary ceasefire. He will not wage war against us. He will not do it. We truly have peace with him. The question is, can I pick up my gun and wage war with God and rebel against him and turn away from him? That's the question. So I don't think it's an appropriate analogy, and I don't think it's accurate. And again, a Catholic can truly say, I have peace with God. I really do, and I can rest in that, knowing that I'm justified because of his works. Um, and of course, we can speak about the different causes of justification and different aspects to justification, initial and ongoing or increasing justification. We've spoken about that many times, so I won't belabor the point here, but um, when you account for the proper distinctions that I believe are not only biblical but also patristic, when you account for the proper distinctions, there's really no problem in what we're saying, and we're not saying what Protestants tend to indicate we're saying when it comes to justification. So I don't find this to be helpful. I find that oftentimes they're unaware of important distinctions in these discussions on justification so that their, their critiques are really invalid. And frankly, what they're truly concerned about with, with Catholicism when it comes to justification, um, there really shouldn't be a concern. What they're truly concerned about um, is, is actually not a problem in Catholicism. It, it does not actually represent us. That doesn't mean that there aren't still differences when it comes to justification and maybe a traditional sola fide view. And here I use traditional loosely, uh, traditional from the point of the Reformation. Um, but once again, with, without just kind of going down a rabbit trail and digressing too far, let me let me just bring it back to the point. We can say we truly have peace with God because God is not going to pick up his arms and start firing at, firing at us. 
Um, he's not going to begin waging war with us. The question is, I, I can, can I have true peace with God, but then decide that, you know what, I don't want that peace anymore, and I want to forfeit it, and I want to rebel against God? That's the question. So the way he sets it up, the way he phrases it, it's already a non-starter, and I don't find it to be helpful. It costs you peace with God, because there is no finished work. No, there, there is a finished work with Christ. The, the question is, how is it applied? That's a different issue, though. Um, most certainly there is a finished work. We believe the book of Hebrews. You know, I've, I've heard him harp on the book of Hebrews and how that completely refutes Catholicism and the Catholic understanding of the sacrifice of the Mass. Most certainly not. Uh, we, we believe in a finished work of Christ. We just believe that it is applied to us ordinarily through the sacraments. But that's a whole other discussion. You have the Mass as a representation in an unbloody fashion of the sacrifice of Calvary. But it does not perfect those for whom it is made. And it, it does perfect them, but again, the question is, can I forfeit and abandon that perfection and return myself to a state of imperfection? So, you, you, again, he, he's setting up the um, parameters of the discussion in a way that it's already a non-starter. And it doesn't properly account for our perspective. I think he should offer some a more nuanced perspective than this. To me, it's 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 the same same content that Dr. White has been pushing for decades. And um, if if, however, his <clears throat> arguments against Catholicism were legit, I could understand him continuing to perpetuate them. But I, I think that there are sufficient responses to what Dr. White has put forward. Um, so that he, he, he might need to retire some of these arguments and look for some others. And you can <clears throat> come to the Mass 10,000 times in your life, still die impure, and end up in purgatory. Un Not because the sacrifice of Christ is impure, the Eucharist is impure, the Mass is imperfect or something like that, but because I can forfeit the perfection, that I can forfeit the grace that it gives to me. That, that's a very different question. Can I forfeit the grace and the perfection that I have in Christ. Now, if you say no, okay, b do so for reasons other than this just simply doesn't perfect you. That's not good enough. We can say it perfects you, but I can then still turn away from that. I still have free will. So you, you, you have to be able to account for the concept here of, of free will. Now, of course, I know he, he's a Calvinist, and I, I used to be as well. And in fact, um, I had Dr. White to thank for being a Calvinist. You know, of course, Dr. R.C. Sproul. Um, so without really going too far into that, I, I think that he would still <clears throat> maintain a form of free will, a form, you know, compatibilism. Um, but do, do you not still have the ability to turn away from God after justification? He's going to say no be, because of his um, understanding of soteriology and tulip, but I, I would argue Yes, it's, it's possible to do that and still say that the work of Christ is finished, it's perfect, it truly does perfect us, and we really receive something perfected in the Eucharist. It's just that we can turn, that, turn away from that. Um, that perfection doesn't mean that my will is absolved, or obliterated, I should say. Undergoing, undergoing the suffering of satispatio. Yeah, which has to do with temporal guilt and temporal punishment it doesn't have to do with eternal guilt so uh all right let's move forward and you can go to the cross ten thousand times in your life and commit a mortal sin before you die and go to hell now do i think the current pope believes any of that and it's not because again christ's uh, atonement is imperfect or the grace given to us and the sacraments are imperfect. It's because I have the ability to turn away from that perfection. That's why I could still be sanctified. I could truly be in Christ. I could cr truly be justified and yet still turn away from him. I, I still have that choice. No, I don't. But that's the point. Because I can guarantee you all the popes before him did, or at least four or five back did without any question. And so, so much for the infallible papacy and the continuity of the teaching office of the church and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so it seems like Dr. White still doesn't understand what we mean by an infallible papacy. Um, and sure, surely he knows better than that. Surely he knows that we've restricted 
papal infallibility to particular instances of teaching, um, not to personal fidelity to the gospel or belief or even non-definitive teachings of the, of the papal magisterium. Um, when I listen to this, um, as somebody who's really just dedicated his, his life at this point to studying the magisterium, when I hear this, I, I feel like I'm reading a, a person who's new to Catholicism on Twitter or something. Um, or, or listening to a video by somebody who's new to Catholicism on, on YouTube, or, which, which most certainly isn't the case for Dr. Wright. He's studied this longer than I've been alive. And so my question is, why straw man the Catholic position this badly? Uh, why not steel man it? So I, I, I don't understand why he would say uh, somehow problems with Pope Francis constitute um, an invalidation of papal infallibility. Surely he knows the invalidating um, criteria for papal infallibility. They're spelled out in Pastor Eternus. Um, if, if you can show me an instance where the criteria is put forward by a pope that you see in Vatican I, and yet what he has defined is heretical, then I would say, okay, you, you may have now invalidated uh, the papacy. But until you do that, you can't just point me to instances that don't meet the criteria of what Vatican II outlined for papal infallibility and then tell me, oh, this is an instance that invalidates papal infallibility. It, it's as if he thinks everything that the Pope teaches or even personally believes is considered definitive in his papal office. It's, I, I just don't understand why he would straw me in the Catholic position this badly, given his his background and uh, the fact that I think that he, he knows better than that. Blah, blah, blah. Because anybody, that's the whole thing. Why would anybody be looking at Roman Catholicism right now? Well, I mean, Catholicism most certainly is a tough sell when, when we consider all of the controversies in the church. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm also sure it was a really hard sell back in the Old Covenant to tell people to join the covenant and worship the one true God of Israel when the vast majority of the people in Israel were serving the Baals and Moloch's and other deities. I'm sure that was a hard sell. Um, so... But just because something is, is, is difficult as far as <laughs> practically pointing to the fidelity of, of our uh, members uh, doesn't mean that the message is somehow invalid or that the society is somehow not what it claims to be. Um, it just means that you have people who are unfaithful. And, and I think that, yeah, there, there's a pretty tough time right now. We, we have a lot of people who are being unfaithful. Um, and there are certainly some difficulties, even with those who are members of the magisterium. Um, I, don't, I don't think any of them have invalidated the claims to the magisterium. Um, but what they have done is they have really challenged the faith of many people who don't have a proper understanding of the magisterium and the extent of its authority and the context of its authority. And even talking about, we're going to read, we're, we're going to listen to him here saying that his, uh, Bayesian uh, analysis has the papacy at 85 to 90 percent in the days of Francis. Yeah, so this is all rhetoric, right? Um, you know, as problematic as I, I think Pope Francis is, um, I think that we, we could still look at previous popes and say that they're equally problematic, but perhaps in a different context and a different way. And yet, I, I wouldn't say that that invalidates the criteria outlined by Pastor Eternus in Vatican I for the office of the papacy or papal infallibility. Um, so <clears throat> I, I, I find what Dr. White to be doing here is he's engaging in good rhetoric, um, but, but very bad and poor articulation of the Catholic perspective um, that's devoid of any necessary and legitimate distinctions that he, he should be affording us. I mean, after all, I mean, he often harps on this idea of, you know, we serve the God of truth, so we need to be truthful in the way that we represent others when we critique them. And he, he often says that with Islam. Okay, well, do that with us as Catholics, too. Be truthful in the way that you represent us if you serve the God of truth. I mean, it's only fair that we call you to consistency, Dr. White, um, which that's another thing from Dr. White. He's, he, he wants to be consistent in his theology and, and his approach. And I commend that. Wonderful. I want to be consistent as well. 
but I'm going to hold his feet to the fire when he's not. And I don't think he's being consistent here. Um, he's, he's not representing us accurately, so that's not serving the God of truth, but elsewhere he harps on that. Um, now, I'm not judging his intentions or motives or anything like that. I, I, I do think perhaps certain biases of his against Catholicism might be distorting his intellect, though. I think that's probably what's going on here. I, I'm not going to speak about his will and his intent, but I, I will say that I think his intellect is being overridden by emotions at this point. All right, let's continue. I, I mean, you know, when I first started saying Roman Catholicism, John Paul II, hey, he had been on the throne for a long time, right? And at least you could make some type of argumentation for continuity of, of teaching content. But you can't do that with Francis. Yes, you can. Um, and, and again, I'm not a fan of his pontificate. But when you look his, at his magisterium, I, I have not seen yet any magisterial reversals on his part um, on any matters of, of doctrine or morals, even, even, of course, in a non-definitive fashion, right? I don't think that Pope Francis has taught anything definitively. So obviously we have to speak about Pope Francis's uh, papal magisterium in the context of non-definitive propositions. I haven't seen him reverse anything as far as a uh, um, actual teaching. Um, he has reversed certain disciplines, and we might criticize some of those reversals. Um, he has made some prudential decisions that could be criticized, but of course, neither one of those are our teachings. So when we speak of his magisterium, we we're we're confined to discussing um, what he is teaching on faith and morals, definitive or non-definitive. It could be either. Uh, but again, since he hasn't taught anything definitively, um, or at least not anything proposed that was previously non-definitive that is now definitive, we have to speak about his non-definitive magisterium. And again, I, I haven't seen anything that he has um, reversed. I, I would love to see it. I mean, this is the topic of my dissertation. If Dr. White has an example of something that Pope Francis has reversed in his papal magisterium that is a teaching, not a discipline or a prudent, prudential decision, I'd love to see that. I mean, I, I know some of the contenders that he would probably want to throw out, a more satizia or the death penalty. Um, I've argued elsewhere, in, in, in fact, in multiple videos, and I'll continue to argue um, that those were not um, reversals of any doctrines. Um, now, I will say that <clears throat> even if Pope Francis reversed a doctrine, that, that's still not against papal infallibility. I mean, we, we believe that magisterial reversals are possible. Obviously, they're in the context of non-definitive teachings, not definitive teachings. You can't reverse a definitive teaching. Um, that would invalidate the claims of the papacy. If So if, if, if that's ever happened, I, I would no longer be Catholic. Um, but I've never seen that happen. Now, Pope Francis could, however, again, reverse a non-definitive teaching of, of a previous pope, and that would still leave papal infallibility intact, um, not only for his magisterium, but of the magisterium of the pope that he reversed, pope or council. I mean, why are we restricting this discussion to just popes? I mean, we, we can't speak of bishops and their magisterium as well. Uh, but oftentimes, Protestants want to truncate discussions of the magisterium to the papacy because that's what they're most familiar with. Um, which isn't very familiar to begin with, but they tend to be a little bit more familiar with that than uh, the other organs of the magisterium. Um, but I digress. Again, my point here is that even if you can point to a reversal on part of Pope Francis, how does that invalidate papal infallibility or discredit the papal magisterium or the magisterium on a whole? It doesn't. Um, magisterial reversals of the non-definitive nature, obviously, um, do not invalidate the claims that we've made about indefectibility or in infallibility. So again, if you properly understand us and the distinctions, distinctions that we made make about the teaching office, um, you won't fall into these, you know, fal false dichotomies or even misunderstandings. But in order to do that, you have to, again, practice what you preach, right? Uh, being truthful and trying to truthfully represent your opponent and, and truthfully um, consider their perspective and, and then respond to it. You know, if you're honest, you know what this guy actually believes. And it's just such a... Um, what Pope Francis believes and what he teaches in his magisterium are two different things. Um, and, and that's a distinction that we can find going back to the patristic era. Um, I'm not saying at all that it's fitting or appropriate that a pope would... Um, 
have a heterodox perspective privately. I'm not at all saying that that's a, a good thing, and I do think it's problematic, and I do think it does harm to the church. Um, but I, I would say that doesn't invalidate our claims about the magisterium and the teaching office. What a pope holds to personally and what he actually promulgates and teaches are, are two very different things. Um, now, if Dr. White can point me to something that Pope Francis has put forward as a teaching um, I, that, that he thinks is problematic and inconsistent with Catholic perspective, I'd love to take a look at it, and I'll, I'll offer a response um, to it if I haven't already, which I'd imagine I already have since most of the things that a Protestant would even be familiar with in these discussions I've already addressed. There, there are some other things that a Protestant, unless they're really studying the magisterium very closely, they wouldn't be familiar with, but... Um, most of the things that they would be a little bit more visible to them I've already addressed anyway, so I don't think that he would present anything anything new. Again, I think what he's doing here is he's just pulling out the rhetoric card. He's, he's not really bringing anything substantial or cogent. Ruse to sit back and go, yeah, but, you know, the Spirit won't let him teach that to the church. What do you mean? He is... Oh, okay, well, what, what, may, what we mean is he won't officially prop, promulgate a, a teaching... Um, in his magisterium, so he won't um, he won't put something forward, perhaps a, in, in say an encyclical or uh, an apostolic constitution um, or any other of the you know um, documents that a pope could issue. We we would say that any proposition on faith and morals that he puts forward in any of those official um, documents that. Uh, show that he's speaking in his teaching office capacity, we would say that those um, are free from error whenever he definitively proposes something. They're not free from error if he puts something forward non-definitively in his papal magisterium. They're not free from error. Um, however, I'm not aware of any papal actual re reversals. I'm, I, I, have, I know that there's quite a few um, examples that some people would put forward as examples of magisterial reversals. But again, that, that's the topic of my dissertation. I still remain unconvinced on it, but I, I will continue to work on it as I work on the dissertation. Um, and, and who knows, maybe my view will change and I'll say, yeah, this is a, a reversal and th this is an actual authentic example. But I, at the very least, in, in theory, I, uh, we, we as Catholics recognize that a pope could put forward something that is erroneous in a non-definitive fashion accord in, 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 in the office of, of the pope in his capacity as um, a teacher. But it wouldn't be something that he definitively proposes. Um, so that's what we mean. Uh, we're, we're talking about what he puts forward in his papal magisterium, definitively speaking, which is objectively identifiable. There, there are objective ways to find this. This isn't something that we just play fast and loose with. There, there are objective indicators to, to discern whenever the pope um, is speaking definitively. So it's not like it's just this shell game. No, we, we can most certainly identify whenever he speaks definitively. I mean, case in point, munificentissimus deus, right? Ineffabilis Deus, uh, the Tome of Leo, just to name a few. All right. He's filled the College of Cardinals with his own acolytes. Is that not teaching the church? No, that's, that's not. Um, I'm a little taken back that this rhetoric has, has now devolved to the point that we were actually unsure of what it means to teach. Um, to select a, call, uh, a cardinal um, is a prudential decision. That is not a teaching matter. Teaching would be to put forth a proposition on faith and morals. That's what a teaching would be. I'm, 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 I'm a little surprised that I'm actually having to define what a teaching is right now uh, to Dr. White. But um, that would be a teaching. He, he's not putting forth a... Um, position on faith and morals by selecting a cardinal. Um, he is making a prudential decision on who should, you know, serve perhaps on a dicastery or um, in the College of Cardinals for voting purposes. That's a prudential decision. That, that's not him acting or him teaching as Pope. Um, again, I'm a little taken back that we're having to make this distinction right now. I'm a little thrown off by this. Um, hmm. 
Okay. So w w once again, prudential decisions, um, are these protected from error? No, even Dona Veritatis recognizes that uh, the magisterium and members of the magisterium can make mistakes in prudential decisions. Uh, no surprise there, right? Uh, as if we didn't already know that one. Um, it does, however, have a curious part in paragraph 24.3 where it notes um, that the magisterium can't perpetually err in its prudential decisions, which I do, I do think that that's a, that's a curious thing that we need to uh, talk further about and explore further. Um, but obviously, this isn't a perpetual prudential decision. This is, um, it, these are individual prudential decisions that he's discussing, so that's outside of the purview of infallibility when it comes to prudential judgments on, on part of the members of the magisterium. So what I'm seeing here is a, is a lack of familiarity on part of Dr. White with how the magisterium functions, which, which isn't surprising just because I've picked up on that uh, a long time ago. Um, just because I've followed his work for many years and I've, I've noticed he's, he's not aware of just the basic concepts of the magisterium. I know that he thinks that he is, um, but that's from the perspective of somebody who has a very limited understanding of the magisterium. You know, when, when you don't know what you don't know, you think you might, you might think that you know a lot until you realize how, you know, how much there really is to magisterial studies. Then you realize, oh, okay, well, may, maybe I didn't know as much as I thought. Um, and, and you can usually point, spot someone pretty easily. It's pretty, they're pretty conspicuous. You can spot somebody pretty quickly um, who knows a lot about the magisterium versus somebody who doesn't. They're, they're very easy to identify. And what I'm hearing here with an inability to even discern uh, what we mean by teaching um, and comparing that to electing a cardinal in the College of Cardinals, a prudential decision, thinking that that's teaching the church, that's such a equivocation of the term teach. I mean, that's not at all what we mean by, by teach. Um, if we're going to redefine terms, we can call that teaching, but now you're redefining terms, and I don't, I don't think that's being truthful. Will that not have more fundamental impact upon the direction of the church? No, that's a different question, right? That's a different question of papal infallibility and in teaching office. Now, when we bring it into the realm of impact, um, this is something I will concede to Dr. White, and, and I've mentioned it before. A pope can do a tremendous amount of damage um, without uttering one teaching, without, even, without uttering a heresy, without uttering even a non-definitive error. A pope can do a whole lot of damage just by really bad prudential decisions. Um, that's beyond dispute, and it's factual at this point. I don't, I don't think that we can say, well, yeah, in theory, the pope could... could could do some harm to the church, but he, he can't actually, you know, but he's never actually done that. No, 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 I, I think it's, I think history at this point, we could say, hmm, yeah, we do have some objective cases of, um, of Pope, Pope's making such bad decisions that it has impacted the church in a negative way, in a harmful way. Um, that only goes so far, however. <clears throat> that only goes so far. I want to be balanced here, although I'll, I'll afford him, I'll grant him that, that point. Um, he, he will not make such bad prudential decisions so excessively that it um, destroys the essence of the church, right? Uh, so he won't <clears throat> completely obliterate, you know, something that's essential to the constitution of the church. Or he, he won't, he won't change the <clears throat> matter of the sacrament of the Eucharist to Doritos and Pepsi, right? Um, and, and promulgate that universally or something, and, and definitively bind your conscience to, <laughs> to something ridiculous like that, right? Uh, but you might say, oh well, that's just so remote. I mean, what's the odd of if if that's the standard for invalidating? You know your your per, your position here. It's just so remote that there's no way to falsify it. No, I, I would I would just that's more of an exaggerated example. I I could give many others that are a little less exaggerated and 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 more likely um, to happen that would invalidate um, our claims. Though granted, I will say, I will grant that. When it comes to infallibility in, in the papal magisterium or even the conciliar magisterium, and when it comes to the indefectibility of the Catholic Church, 
it is a limited definition. Um, it affords and allows for a fair amount of damage, a fair amount of error. If you want to criticize Catholicism, criticize it for that. And just say, well, look, your perspective of infallibility and your perspective of indefectibility is, is, is fairly limited. Oh, okay, fair, fair enough. Fair enough. You want to criticize us? Criticize us on those grounds. Um, but don't criticize us on the grounds that somehow him electing, you know, or choosing bad cardinals somehow invalidates the infallibility of the church or indefectibility or something like that. Um, it, it doesn't. But I would agree with him that it is harmful to the church, right? Bad prudential de decisions and disciplinary decisions that are harmful um, are, are most certainly that. They are harmful. All right. Then anything you would have to say, of course it will. I, it's just... It's just amazing these days. You know, I know how it was back in the 90s. Well, we have the Pope and we have the continuity of the teaching office and blah, 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 blah. You don't have that anymore. And there Yeah, we, we do have the continuity of the teaching office and the papal magisterium. We, we still have that even under the pontificate of Francis. And I'm not a fan at all of Pope Francis. Um, I respect him as the Holy Father. Um, I'll be charitable to him, but I don't think that he's fit to be Pope. I, I just don't. I don't think that this is for him. Um, however, in God's providence, God allows for him to hold that office. And for as long as God allows him to hold that office, I will respect him um, as the person who holds that office. I personally don't think that he should be in that position. I, I think that he should um, step down and let somebody who is wiser um, and more capable step into that position. Um, I don't think he's going to do that. But, I mean, that's that's my personal opinion of, about Pope Francis. So I say that to say I, I, I'm not a person who really is a big fan of Pope Francis at the same time. I think he's done some good things. Um, I think he has good, in, good intentions. I think that um, he ought to be respected and we ought to be charitable in our, um, our assessments of, of Pope Francis. At the same time, we can charitably uh, push back on certain problematic aspects of of this pontificate I, I don't have a problem doing that um so some of the criticisms that pope francis um that james white would offer about pope francis some of them i might agree with some of them i wouldn't uh just depends on what they are but again none of this does away with our claims about the papal magisterium and the teaching office of the pope so um i i'm not exactly sure um why he thinks that somehow our claims have been invalidated by this pontificate. Uh, again, that's within the purview and, and the scope of, of my dissertation. I would love to know um, what he thinks that Pope Francis has reversed in teaching office. Um, now, I, I think we all know that, you know, Dr. White would, wouldn't be able to put anything substantial forward in, in, in that in that way but hey just in case he's able to I, i'd love to hear it but i I, th I think that right now he's bluffing um and this is rhetoric and it's going to be good enough for most people who listen to dr white they're going to hear this and think oh man that's a really good point um, but for a, a, a person who's really um reflective and and really thinks through issues and wants to be fair they're going to have to end up saying you know, I'm not so certain that this is a legitimate critique of Catholicism when it, when it comes to its teaching office. You might have a fair critique in um, how well Pope Francis uh, governs the church, but um, is, is this really something that invalidates the Catholic claims to teaching authority? There's a lot of people recognizing it, uh, but I guess that doesn't fit into the you know, calculations or something. Uh, but there's no, there's no recognition of the theological content of the teaching of the Eucharist in the sense of what it really means, that there is no finished work, and that's why there is no peace. Yeah, I, again, I don't want to repeat myself too much, but we do believe that there is a finished work, um, and there truly is peace. I, I, I don't accept this um, rhetorical perspective that he's taking. Um, his definition of peace, I don't think, is the biblical definition. Um, so I would challenge that. Um, and his definition of finished work. I, I think that our understanding of the finished work of Christ is consistent with the book of Hebrews. So I, I'm not convinced. 
any sin that you commit will be imputed to you. And here's here's the question. No, not any sin that you commit will be imputed to you. Um, surely he's aware that, you know, venial sins wouldn't be imputed to you. Um, now, grave sins um, would. How is that consistent with having peace of the peace of God? Well, the, the point is we have that peace unless we turn our back on him and commit some kind of grave sin. Um, the, the past sins are no longer imputed to you. They're forgiven. That doesn't mean that a sin that I now go and commit in the future couldn't be imputed to me. See, that's, that's reading too much into the text, and I would say that's a position that's unwarranted. Um, I'll come back to this text in a second. But here's, here's the, the question that I've been asking Roman Catholics for a very, very long time. And Cameron texted me, so hopefully he's listening, or will listen. <clears throat> what is the cost? The cost is being the blessed man. The cost is being... Yeah, uh, again. It's not. It, there is a cost of not being the blessed man as Dr. White understands it. But it's not going to be um, the cost of being the blessed man as Paul articulates it in, in uh, the book of Romans. Um, so I, I would not want to conflate Dr. White's understanding of the blessed man with the biblical understanding. I would say that uh, there's enough of a distinction there um, for us to be able to say that our position is um, reconcilable with the biblical understanding, although it might not be reconcilable with Dr. White's understanding, but I don't really care to reconcile the Catholic perspective with Dr. White's understanding. I don't, I don't have a reason to do that. All right. Being the blessed man. Romans chapter 4, verse 4. Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and nobody is saying that we are justified, um, especially when it comes to initial justification, but even for increases in justification. Nobody is saying that, you know, when it comes to strict merit, God actually owes us justification. That's not being said for initial justification. That's not even being said for ongoing justification or increases in justification, as I tend to call them, and as Trent uh, put, puts it. Um, so, again, straw man, straw man. And this just, again, still confirms that Dr. White still doesn't properly understand the Catholic understanding of justification. Um, and is not sufficiently interacting with the best that we have to offer. He might be interacting with um, some more of the low-hanging fruit uh, content that's put out there on part of some Catholics, but I don't think he's offering um, interaction with the best that we have to offer on justification here. Uh, a Catholic can say everything that is there in Romans 4 and still say what the Council of Trent says, properly understood. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and, and I do believe it's credited. I, I do believe that initial justification is imputed. Um, I also want to say simultaneously it's also infused. So I, I expect both. It, it's not only imputed, um, but simultaneously it is infused, and then it makes us what we are um, claimed to be, declared to be. Um, not on the basis it, it alone of, of having been infused, but of course... Um, because of the meritorious work of Christ. So, um, again, distinctions are important. Nuance is important. Here's why. Now, there is a whole um, discussion. I've done entire presentations on this. You can go back and look at it in regards to how these two are parallel to one another. You notice, Tode ergaza meno to the one working. Tode me ergaza meno to the one not working. So they're in, they're in parallel. What does he mean by work? Yeah, that's that's an important part to consider. What does he mean by work? Um, now, some might say, well, he's just talking about the works of the law, and, and, and he's just by that he's just meaning circumcision and stuff like that, and obviously these boundary markers are not something that Catholics are putting forward. They're, 
there's some truth to that. But I think that Paul could say the same thing about the moral works. No, nobody is justified by the moral works um, concerning initial justification. And, and what he has in mind is initial justification. He's, he doesn't have in mind increasing justification. Um, Romans is, is addressing the issue of initial justification. We can go elsewhere for the concept of increases in justification. But he's, he's singling in on initial justification. And yeah, for initial justification, you don't bring any kind of works, moral or, you know, Jewish boundary markers or something like that. Um, I don't know any Catholic who's worth their salt that would say that. Um, now, when we speak of after initial justification, do moral works justify only in the sense that it, they increase our justification, not that they are the grounds of that justification. Um, and that increase we can speak of as um, having the reward of eternal life, but you could also speak of having eternal life when you were initially justified when you didn't have any works. So it's not, a, it's not when we speak of a reward of eternal life, we're not saying that, well, you didn't have eternal life until you did these moral works. No, you had an eternal life from the moment that you were initially justified by Christ. Um, through the faith alone that you have brought. Of course, it's a living faith, a faith informed by charity, but we can speak of faith alone in, in response to, or in the context of initial justification, and we have eternal life in that moment. I don't have any, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. We, we can truly say that with initial justification. I don't have any moral works. I don't have any other kind of works that I'm bringing. And in that moment, being justified, I, I w if I were to die in that moment, I would have eternal life, even without any kind of moral works. So again, like I said, important distinctions are important, and unless you make these proper distinctions that are legitimate, uh, they're, they're not arbitrary. These are legitimate distinctions that I would say are biblical and patristic and um, are, are the distinctions that you would find in the Catholic understanding. Um, when you make these proper distinctions, you don't fall into the uh, crosshairs of Dr. Klein. Um, and again, it, it just kind of sounds to me like Dr. White hasn't accounted for the best that we have to offer on justification. He's just kind of stuck on, uh, some of the content that he's heard previously. And he thinks that sufficiently engages the best that we have to offer. Well, to one another. And so the idea of working so as to receive, um, that is Lagidzatai, it is imputed not according to karen, grace, but according to ophilema, what is owed, what is due. Yeah, but no, no Catholic work there, Salt, would say that we're owed initial justification because of any kind of works. Again, um, the way I've, I've likened it is, you know, my troops are on this hill over here. And he's attacking this hill over here that is empty. And we're all just sitting on this hill kind of looking over there like, uh, hey, we're over here. I mean, you're, you're bombing the mess out of that hill. Good job. You got some pretty impressive artillery, but uh, we're over here. I don't know why you're, you know, destroying a straw man. Uh, but wow. Wow. Um, good work. Good work. Um, fortunately, however, that's not our position. Um, so, yeah. I would like to see them, again, engage what the best that we have to offer, not kind of the low-hanging fruit Catholics who might present an understanding of justification in the way that he's presenting it. Um, but that would be like me going after uh, somebody who says that um, sola scriptura is that there aren't any authorities outside of scripture at all for anything even mathematics <laughs> you know <laughs> unless the math is in the bible or something you, you can't know that would be absurd that's not sola scriptura that's not the proper understanding of it but you'll find some protestant out there who says something like that right but that's not engaging the best that protestants have to offer if i want to really engage somebody who takes a position of sola scriptura i'm going to go to others Keith Matheson or somebody like that. Um, I'm, I'm going to go to somebody who has a, a more thorough um, understanding of, of sola scriptura than the low-hanging fruit. And 
I would just simply say, I mean, return the favor. Do, do the same thing. Go, go after the best that we have to offer, not the low-hanging fruit. And the best that we have to offer doesn't, you know, fall prey to this criticism. But then the opposite of that, to the one not working, but believing. There's the issue. Sola fide. Yeah, and again, I don't have a problem um, accepting sola fide, sola fide for initial justification, um, as long as that faith is understood to be a faith formed by charity. Um, and even Benedict the Sixteenth has has put that forward as as compatible with the Catholic perspective, and that does not go against um, what some Protestants think when it comes to Trent, session uh, six, canon nine, I believe. Now, session six was on justification, and the canon nine is the one that um, condemns faith alone. But the kind of faith alone, as I've, I've pointed out in previous videos, the kind of faith alone that it's going against is not a faith formed by charity and not what we're speaking about here. It's going against a faith alone, and it qualifies what that means if you read the rest of the canon, meaning that man's will is not. Uh, consenting uh, to the justification um, but I, I would just simply say man's will consenting though obviously it's by grace right I mean he, he couldn't consent to it uh, we're not Pelagians uh, he could not consent to it apart from grace but yeah sure with with grace that goes before that decision man consents to this but that wouldn't be a work consenting to something is not a work um, so you would have to show that free will and consent is incompatible with justification and um, sola fide. And I, I don't think that that has been properly demonstrated. Um, <clears throat> but again, that's what it's refuting. That's what it's condemned. If you continue reading Trent, it's nowhere else refuted um, a, a view of faith alone that I've expressed here. Now, this view of faith alone that I've expressed might be different than some of the uh, perspectives that you might see various uh, Catholic theologians in that contemporary age articulating. I don't know. Sure. So what? Um, my view and even the Catholic view of, of certain things is different than what Augustine put forward. So, um, yeah, good and holy men can make mistakes. And, it, you know, it sometimes takes time for us to refine certain perspectives. Um, and I, I do think that we've been able to refine certain perspectives because of the abuses that happened uh, during the time that led up to the Reformation. So it's, it's made us have to work through these things, but some of that takes time. And the view that I put forward here doesn't, doesn't fall under the condemnation of Trent by any means. It's compatible with everything Trent puts forward, um, but it also doesn't meet the uh, description of what Dr. White is presenting as, as Catholics, and it, it doesn't fall in the condemnation of what uh, Romans 4 and what Paul is talking about. So we, we don't fall into the category of, of who um, Paul is refuting there. We, we can agree with what Paul is saying. So uh, I'm disappointed, but let's, uh, let's do a little bit more. Not kicking the door open the entire sacramental system by saying, well, faith working through love. Mm -hmm. But I'm, but see here, that's also a misunderstanding. When we speak of faith working through love, that's in reference to um, increases in justification. That's, that's not in reference to initial justification. Um, faith working in love does not apply to that moment. And by initial justification, as I've said so many times, but maybe I need to define that term here. Um, initial justification pertains to that moment where you go from being condemned and you're part of the first Adam and you're under the curse of the law. You go from being in that state to being in the state that you're in Christ. You're no longer condemned. You have peace with God. You're justified. You have eternal life. Um, that transition, going from being damned, if you will, to blessed, from going to hell to going to heaven, you know, for sure what I guess, um, that transition is what we would call initial justification, and it's entirely unmerited. Um, no works are put forward, even works working in love. That's not put forward. You don't even have time to, where's the time to put works working in love for initial justification? And initial justification is instantaneous. It's immediate. 
you don't have time to put forward any kind of works, even if you could, which we don't. Um, the works that we put forward after being initially justified pertain to increases in justification, and there are, of course, works done in grace. Um, but that's when they apply to increases of justification, not to initial justification in, in that position or that translation of being part of the first Adam to being under the second Adam. Um, and really, when you listen to the Protestantism, that's what they're trying to safeguard against. And, hey, you know what? We got that one covered. We're, and we're right there with you. We're not Pelagians. We're right there with you. Um, but that being said, they're going to say initial justification is all that there is. There isn't increases in justification um, uh, among some other different perspectives on justification. And so there are legitimate differences between Catholics and, and Protestants on justification. I'm not saying that there aren't. Uh, but the thing that they're really trying to guard against is, is not something that we fall under. It's not something that we're guilty of. It's a misunderstanding on their part and maybe also bad articulation on our part, feet on the ground. The contrast here is between working and believing. Mm -hmm. That's different context, faith, working, love. I agree. I agree. I agree. Again, but my troops are over here and you're attacking this hill. I don't think that Catholics have never put forward the view that faith working and love um, is necessary as the grounds of obtaining initial justification. I mean, show me that canon in Trent. Show, show that one to me. I'd love to see that. If, if, if you can show that to me, I'll repent and say, oh man, I'm way off here. It's not there. It's not there. I've read Trent multiple times, but I even went back over the sixth session just the other day again and uh yeah no it's not there everything i said is completely compatible with what trent is putting forward so the the biblical perspective here is not at all at all at odds with what the council of trent is putting forward it's at odds with his understanding of what we believe at the council of trent sure but i don't equate dr white's understanding of catholicism to be catholicism any more than i equate dr white's understanding of scripture to be scripture uh, or to be the proper interpretation of Scripture, I should say. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with him. I agree with him. This, the context of faith, working, and love is not the one that um, Paul is, is speaking about. I, I totally agree. Yeah. Now that we've established that, can we move forward and get to a better uh, criticism of Catholicism? I would really appreciate it if we could do that instead of harping on the same stuff that we've had to respond to many times and evidently they're not listening to. Uh, believes in the one justifying the ungodly, his faith is reckoned to him as righteousness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That faith, that empty hand of faith. Yeah. And then when David... Yeah, it's empty handed because we're, we're not bringing any works with it. Any kind of works. Works of the law, and if you want to understand those as boundary markers, okay, throw in more works. We're not bringing those either for initial justification. That faith is not a mere assent. I would say it's more than that because even demons have assent. So um, it's not a mere assent, intellectual assent, uh, that that God, you know, justifies the ungodly or something like that, or that there is a God. It's not a mere intellectual assent. It is a faith formed by charity, but it, it's it's not the the charity working in love that is the grounds of that initial moment of justification. It's just, it's simultaneous. That initial moment of justification, there's also immediately an infusion of justification. Um, and with that infusion, uh, there is this now ability to work in love, in grace, but it, it's not the grounds for that initial just, justification. But I could see where they're getting confused. I, I would just want to say that as long as we're making those proper distinctions, we don't fall under the criticism that you have to offer so again we i really think that protestants need to um listen to what we're saying and 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 put forward a better um a better criticism of catholicism as soon as just repeating the same misinformation and and caricature over and over david also speaks verse six of the blessing of the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. So, so notice, 
Paul's assertion is legizete de caiasune, chorus ergo. God imputes righteousness apart from works. Mm -hmm. This is what God does. Mm -hmm. But it's fascinating, the text he quotes from Psalm 32, Psalm 33, etc. Um, when he quotes this material, look at what it's about. It, it's not about the imputation of righteousness. So did Paul miss it? No. Notice what it is. <coughs> Excuse me. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. So, lawless deeds, anemiae, hamartiae, sins and lawless deeds have been forgiven and covered over. And in verse 8, blessed is the man who who ooh, may la gesetai kurios hamartion. Blesses the man to whom ume la gesetai, er subjunctive strong denial. The Lord will never, will not impute sin. Yeah, he, he won't take any of the sins that we have committed and impute them to, a, to us again. He will not do that. That's a different question of, in the future, if I commit a grave sin, will he now impute that to me? That's a different question of, at that point in time, any sin that I've committed, will God now impute to me? No, he will not. And that's why we truly have peace with him. Um, but can I start a war with him again and create new sins? Yeah, I can. And those he will impute to me unless I repent of them. You see the lack of distinctions here that, that Dr. White makes? I see where he goes astray. I see where he gets confused, but he's, he's reading into the text. He, he's, he's thinking, well, because it says that he will never impute this, that, that means that future sins will never be imputed to him. Well, that's actually not what it says. It doesn't speak about any future sins. It's just merely talking about sins up until this point, obviously, contextually, clearly. I mean, it's clearly not speaking explicitly or even implicitly about future sins. Um, you would need to show me where contextually it's speaking about future sins. Show me where he is talking about future sins in Romans 4 or in the Psalms, and then your point will have been established. But until you can show that, I'm going to say, I don't assume that. You're, you're assuming that, and the burden of proof is on you to demonstrate that he's talking about future sins because he never says that. Now, if you know Roman Catholic theology, and there are a lot of people who think they do, but they don't, I've been talking about Cameron here. Well, I mean, hey, let's be fair. I don't think Dr. White knows Roman Catholic theology well himself. And again, I say that as somebody who's followed his work for years and read his books on Catholicism as well as other books of his. And yeah, he he knows more than the average Protestant. Yeah, I'll give him that. But um, I don't. I still wouldn't put him in the category of somebody who knows a lot about. Uh, Catholic theology. So I'm just saying, hey, be be fair here when talking about others who don't know Catholic theology, because you know, with all due respect, I, th I think you fall in that category. If you know Roman Catholic theology, and you ask any believing Roman Catholic, if you commit a mortal sin, mm -hmm. now there is no infallible definition of exactly what that means, and you'll. You don't have to have one. You don't have to have an infallible definition of everything to have moral certitude of what something means. Um, here, here we go with that <laughs> caricature again from Dr. White. <sighs> Once again, a straw man. Uh, you don't, you don't have to have it. But I mean, it's partly, it's, it's partly because of Catholics that some Catholics, misinformed Catholics, that he has these views. So, but at the same time, I don't think it's ex excusable because he's in a position to dispel this ignorance. Um, and, and to have a better and a more informed position um, and knowledge of the Catholic position. But I, I think that he probably heard some Catholics say things along this, these lines, and he's taking that to be, oh, this is Catholicism. Um, yeah, this idea that you have to have an infallible certitude of everything is absolutely absurd. Um, you don't need a definitive magisterial intervention in the vast majority of cases on faith and morals. You just don't. I mean, um, once we've gotten to the issue of how we, d we determine the canon, once we've identified the canon, 
um, I would say scripture is pretty explicit on quite a few things and um, even the consensus throughout the ages on certain matters are, are pretty evident so um, in the majority of cases you wouldn't need some kind of objective magisterial arbitration uh, to offer a definitive intervention but I mean hey in some rare cases you do need a definitive magisterial intervention but those are rare cases Th this wouldn't be one um, what constitutes mortal sin I think is 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 pretty um, explicitly clear in the catechism um, though obviously I know the catechism is not magisterial per se um, what it puts forward there is reflective of the magisterium on this on this matter. We'll get different definitions depending on what priest talked to. But you commit a mortal sin. Uh, At least in you know, fortunately, what priests you talk to isn't the standard of identifying what the Catholic perspective is. Fortunately, um, straw man. What what a Catholic priest says. I mean, gosh. Um, if that were the standard of what Catholicism is, what a Catholic priest says, oh, we're in trouble. Uh, <laughs> fortunately, that's not the standard, and I think he knows better than that. Orthodox historic Roman Catholicism, called Catholicism since Trent, uh, the grace of justification is destroyed. And you're alone. No yeah, but again, notice, keep your eyes on the ball, pay attention, remember the fact that he read Romans 4 to you and there was nothing about future sins uh, not being imputed to you. He read that into the text, he's still assuming it. And I want to say, burden of proof is on you to show. Burden of proof is on you to show that future sins, and grave ones, will not be imputed to you if you remain in a state of unrepentance now if future grave sins yeah if, if you repent of them they won't be imputed to you uh, although that's not what paul's talking about here contextually because he's, he's not talking about future uh future actions he's, he's talking about past sins um but we could go elsewhere for the concept that you know even your future sins post baptism would be forgiven if if you are um if, if you truly repent um even though i know there was a controversy over post-baptismal forgiveness of sins in the early church um i think the the biblical perspective rightly won out um and that is that there is a post-baptismal forgiveness of sins available to people who are sincerely repentant so but I, I would have to go elsewhere to substantiate that i wouldn't go to romans 4 to prove that but again just notice that he's reading into romans 4 no longer at peace with god and you have to be re-justified you have to go through penance, enter back. Penance doesn't justify anybody. Is he, is he under the impression that penance justifies somebody? I, I thought that this was just Catholicism 101. I mean, look, he, he's written the Catholic controversy, right? I mean, he's written about Catholicism. Um, as a published author who has written on Catholicism, you know, with all due respect, shouldn't you know that uh, penance does not justify somebody. Penance pertains to temporal punishment, not the removal of eternal guilt. I, I expect to have to clarify these kinds of misconceptions with, you know, somebody who's new to Catholicism. But you don't expect to have to clarify these things with somebody who is a published author on Catholicism and has done many moderated debates on it and has spent more decades than I've been alive on it. It's kind of odd. Just I, I, I don't understand why he's, he's misrepresenting Catholicism this poorly when, when I think he's in a position to know better. You know, if, if he's ignorant here, I think it's a culpable ignorance. Um, it'd be pretty easy to dispel. I mean, I've been able to dispel that perspective and that ignorance. So if I'm able to, I know Dr. White is able to. He's he's more capable than I. So if I'm able to know that penance doesn't justify somebody, um, I think he's able to know that too. Back into that state of friendship with God, sacramentally. If you die in that state, you'll be lost. Like I said, I, I really doubt the majority... Of the magisterium in the Roman Catholic Church actually believes this anymore. 
but it is what's taught. When he says the majority of the magisterium, I, I guess he means the majority of like members of the magisterium. Because the magisterium itself hasn't changed anything, but I guess he means members of the magisterium. I don't know what they believe. I mean, their fidelity and their personal orthodoxy, in some cases, is, is questionable in my estimation. Um, but again, that doesn't, um, that doesn't invalidate our claims to teaching authority because somebody can hold a teaching office um, and personally not be fit to hold that office um now when it comes to the magisterium of the individual bishop there's there's no promise of indefectibility individually or infallibility individually they could completely teach heresy in their magisterium and some of them might so i'm not making any apologies for them um i'll be right there and criticizing them with dr white but I just want to make sure that we're doing it appropriately and not assuming that this somehow impacts the magisterium itself. And you've got to deal with the fact that the leadership and what is taught in the allegedly infallible dogmatic documents don't quite meet up anymore. you got to deal with... Infallibly dogmatic documents. Yeah. You remember earlier when I was talking about it's pretty easy and you know people who don't know about the magisterium they're really conspicuous here's here's how you identify some of these things somebody who speaks of a, an infallible document um first of all infallible technically speaking pertains to the organ of the magisterium the person who's teaching uh not the teaching itself so it's improper to speak of an infallible teaching Loosely, I'll speak of it just for the sake of accommodating the audience, but it's, it's improper to speak of an infallible teaching. Um, it is appropriate to speak of an irreformable teaching or a definitive teaching. What is infallible is the organ, you know, in certain cases, the Pope or an ecumenical council, the College of Bishops. It's appropriate. You, you, you only speak of infallibility concerning the organ, not the um, object of the teaching. Um, moreover, infallible documents, again, another conspicuous part here showing that he doesn't understand it, the basics of the magisterium. Uh, he, he might need to check out my class, Understanding the Magisterium. Uh, I have it available, MaximusInstitute.com. There's a, there, Put in a plug for it. There we go. Uh, MaximusInstitute.com, Understanding the Magisterium. I think that would help him. Uh, I'd be happy to send him a free access to it. Um, not only is he misusing the term infallible, but documents are not infallible. Documents are not even definitive. So even if we're going to use the proper language, such as definitive, documents are not definitive. Propositions within a document might be. And that's an important distinction. That's a vital distinction. Um, because what that means is, munificentissimus deus, for example, uh, that puts forward a definitive ex cathedra teaching. Is the entire document definitive? No. No, it's improper to speak of the entire document as um, it's actually erroneous to speak of the entire document as, as definitive. Um, the only thing that's definitive is the defined proposition in that document. So speaking of infallible documents, we have two problems there already. It's the improper use of infallible, and there is no such thing as an infallible document, even if it were the proper use of the term. Um, because it's propositions that are definitive, not documents. I mean, I guess a pope could, like, literally put, you know, define, like, I, I suppose he could offer a definition on something and just offer that as the entire document. <laughs> so in that case, we could speak of a definitive document. No, thing has, no, no such thing has ever been done before, and it would be, it would be really... It'd be really hard to actually put that forward. <laughs> In fact, nearly impossible. You would, you would have to have a few 
prefatory sentences to set that one up anyway. So <laughs> I'm not sure how you would even do that. But even if you could, OK, that would be the one example in history. Um, so, again, the, the things like that, whenever you study the magisterium, um, people who don't know much about the magisterium are, are really conspicuous. Right. And, and I, I don't say that to be arrogant. I, I say that to say, um, let's let's be candid for a moment. Um, Dr. White presents himself as if he understands Catholicism. And frankly, I would say he doesn't understand even the basics, um, at least of the magisterium. But I would also say of other aspects as well. Um, and I just give you an example because he doesn't understand the very basics of the terminology and con concepts involved with the magisterium. And if you don't understand that, you're not in a position to criticize the magisterium. I'm sorry. You're just not in a position. Maybe you can criticize something else that doesn't relate to the magisterium. But you most certainly can't criticize anything that's related to the magisterium if you don't know the basics. I mean, I, I stand by that. So I, I want to be frank. Um, Dr. White is not in a position to be making the claims that he's making. Um, all right, let's watch maybe just a few more minutes and we'll, we'll wrap it up. Deal with that. But that's teaching. If you commit a venial sin, which does not destroy the grace of justification, it's still imputed to you. And you have to bear the temporal punishments. It's not imputed to you in the way that what he's talking about there um, contextually. He's talking about an imputation that would make you no longer at peace with God. Um, and and that's, venial sins don't do that. And incurring temporal guilt doesn't mean you're no longer at peace with God. You, you are. So I, I, it's it's a little concerning that we're we're having to go over the fundamentals of of what temporal guilt is in relation to um, our standing with God. I, I, I'm just still taken back by the fact that we're even having the dis, this discussion. As I said, I mean, this is a first impression review, so I had no idea what Dr. White was going to say. Although I had a fair idea that it would probably be the same old, same old. Um, and yeah, it's the same old, same old. But it's still, sometimes you're just still taken back, like, just taken back whenever you have to hear this stuff from somebody that is capable of so much more, capable of representing us so much better, um, and offering a better argument. It just kind of takes you back, you know, especially from somebody who harps on, be, be truthful, and again, I'm not imputing dishonesty to him but he's not doing due diligence to be truthful here because uh, again this ignorance could be dispelled pretty easily for that sin and unless you're a saint and have more merit than you have temporal punishments that's why you go to purgatory yeah and, and part of this is our fault right I mean a lot of us have spoken historically about purgatory as a place that you go to um Although, of course, the definitions of purgatory never, um, they do not include time or a place, um, or they don't define what the purgatorial fire actually is. I, I definitely take the approach that the purgatorial fire and purgation is an experience of encountering Christ. It's a purifying fire when you encounter a pure and holy God. Um... I take that perspective that's consistent with the dogmatic definitions and, and, and the positions that Catholicism has officially adopted on purgatory, but I know that I know that some Catholics have spoken of it in temporal aspects, temporal terms, and um, some of the some of the ways that we have in practice um, spoken about or thought of purgatory as has has kind of gone in the direction of what he's criticizing but I would say hey that's a legitimate criticism um, and and we needed to fine-tune our perspective of purgatory um, so I won't I won't defend anybody who thinks that pur purgatory is an actual place or that the purifying fire is something distinct from 
an encounter with God. So I, I don't like go to purgatory. I, I think of you, you, would, you die, you immediately see Christ in the particular judgment, and that encounter is a purifying fire. Um, maybe I could do a part two. Um, I don't want to make this one of those long, epic Lord of the Rings length marathons where I go three and a half hours reviewing a video. Um, so I'll just, I'll leave it there. But if y'all want me to do a part two, just let me know, put it in the comment section or maybe email me reason and theology at gmail.com patrons message me on Patreon or YouTube members. Just again, email me at reason and theology at gmail.com and tell me that you're, um, a member on YouTube and, um, I'll, that way I get your feedback. If you want me to do a part two and I'll continue to review the content, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to do so. Um, looks like we only reviewed about 15 minutes uh, worth of um, of content there so plenty more of it, I, I would imagine uh, to interact with but like I said I want to keep this fairly fairly brief we're at about an hour and 15 minutes or so so we'll, we'll end it there but let me know your thoughts there in the comment section also make sure to check me out patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if you want to support me um, and also uh, hit that subscribe button and share this on your social media. Spread the word about what we're doing here with Reason and Theology if you've enjoyed this content. We'll see you later. God bless.